Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the South Lewis Community College Lecture Series. I am pleased to be here with you and the members of our audience who are live with us, as well as those of you joining us on our YouTube channel. Let me recognize the presence of our acting vice principal, Mr. Grit Harris, Harris, as well as our national epimediologist, I have to take my time to say that word, Dr. Michelle Fassois, other members of the medical fraternity, staff of the South Lewis Community College, thank you so much for being here with us. And of course, all of those of you joi um, joining us live. We are here with our second lecture in a series that we hope to continue, especially with our association with the Vaughan Arthur Lewis Research Institute, Valerie. And today, we are very, very proud to host an alumnus of the college. He graduated here some years ago and has made some significant strides, and we are so happy that he has returned to partner with us. So we will be hearing from Dr. Avian Ogist, and without further ado, I will invite our resident nurse, Mrs. Lisa de Turville, to introduce our guest lecturer for today. Good morning, all. Protocol has already been established. Good morning. I'm here today to present Dr. Avian August. Dr. Avian August is a St. Lucian born epidemiologist working on cancer related projects at the Gustave Rossi Comprehensive Cancer Center in Paris. He graduated from the Sir Arthur Lewis Community College in St. Lucia in 2011 with an advanced level of certificate. He holds a bachelor's degree in biochemistry and biology from the University of the French, of, sorry, for, from the University of the French West Indies in Martinique, a French matrice in public health from the Bordeaux School of Public Health and a master's degree in epidemiology from the University of Burgundy in France. Dr. Ogis, completed a doctoral thesis in 2019 at the Université de Rennes on the epidemiology of the head and neck cancer risk factors in the French West Indies under the guidance of host lab at the French National Institute for Health and Medical Research. He started his postdoctoral journey at the Guadeloupe Cancer Registry, the University Hospital of Guadeloupe, where he worked for two years. Throughout his years of research in cancer epidemiology, Dr. Ogis held positions as an adjunct lecturer at the F University of the French West Indies in Guadeloupe and at the Department of Health and Wellness at the Sir Arthur Lewis Community College in St. Lucia. He advocates for health equity in low and middle income countries. Dr. Ogis is the co-lead of the head and neck cancer working group within African Caribbean Cancer Consortium. He also leads research projects at the Vaughan Arthur Lewis Institute for research and innovation, focusing on small island health systems and cancer prevention in under-resourced settings. Dr. Ogis. Oh, thanks so much for the introduction. I hope everyone can hear me. Um, so uh, it's a real delight to be here this morning and to be able to present to you on this topic that I really hold very dear to me. I believe that uh, health equity is important. We need to produce health research that is viable and helpful to produce positive outcomes for our populations. And uh, I believe that as well, advocate for health research that can also help us move towards resilience and sustainability as a country. So the talk, the, sorry. So the objective of this talk this morning is to demonstrate how indigenous research can help build a better health system for Ireland. The idea behind this is that for the first part of my presentation, I will be showcasing some of the issues uh, that we have in St. Lucia um, in public health. I will also go through some of my significant findings for the, over the past few years, which would contribute or speak to some possible recommendations to solve these problems. 
And I'll use this occasion to present on a brand new concept that I'm working on that involves St. Lucia. Okay, so to start off, I'm gonna give some very brief statistics for those persons who may not be experts in the field. So according to reports from the Pan-American Health Organization, St. Lucia is a typical Caribbean country, which means that the heaviest burden on mortality is with non-communicable diseases. So in our context, we have about 82% of all deaths in St. Lucia, which are, which are attributable to non chemical diseases. Then we have injuries, uh, for example, car accidents or violence, which come at 11%, and then infectious diseases at 7, 7.9%. So now when we look at NCD risk factors uh, compared to the rural population, it will appear that St. Lucia um, high blood pressure is bad, but not that bad. When we look at other um, risk factors, such as overweight and obesity, the problem becomes a bit more severe. More severe, where we have um, prevalence as a, a little over the world, uh, world prevalence. And diabetes apparently is one of the uh, very big problem, critical area where we, the, our prevalence is almost twice as high, uh, twice as high than the, the world prevalence. So when you get the cancer burden um, in St. Lucia, reliable statistics are very hard to come by, it's very scarce, uh, but from what we do know in availability databases, we, the incidence is very elevated, but uh, good news is not as high as certain Caribbean countries such as Martin and Guadeloupe. So this is a new one we know so far. Um, however, when you look at the problem of mortality, the number of deaths per year, this is a critical area where it needs to be addressed because we have a number of deaths which is very close to the number of new cases. So if you do a bit of public health, you, this would be to suggest that the, there's a problem with survivorship in St. Lucia as it pertains to cancer. So let me ask, what are the big problems? Uh, what are the major causes of these problems? Where is this, this heavy cancer burden coming from? So I just wanna take one minute to highlight some of the common quotes that I hear in, on the one on the ground in St. Lucia. And I think it's a common question everyone's asking themselves. So most persons would say our health system is a, is a nonsense, right? To be put it very kindly. Uh, maybe the patients have their own way of saying things. They have their own version of the story. They say that St. Lucian doctor just killing people. So I'm sure you've heard that, that, that before. And then the doctors have their own version of things. They may want to blame the patient and say that the patient came too late for a diagnosis. It's too late, I can't do anything, right? And then at my personal favorite, which is a very, something that um, representative of the, the general population, St. Lucia likes to eat too much chicken box. This is things that I actually heard in my um, time here in St. Lucia and for, for consuming various media. And uh, when we ask ourselves, so who really is at fault? Is it the patients, is it the doctors, is it, is it the policymakers? Could be the policymakers because their policies are bad or because they're not making policy whatsoever. Maybe the healthcare provider themselves so far maintaining people in, in, in their sick state to be able to milk all the money out of them. Maybe it's our environment, maybe it's too much banana planting, plantations all around the place. Our environment is probably slowly killing us. Or are we just bad patients? Are we, how, do we have horrible lifestyles that push us and drive us to, to have poor health outcomes? And also there's a the question of genetics. There are so many people who have family members who may be, who be affected by cancer. So there's possible evidence that it's still in the family. So, right. so my take on this is that it's a little bit of everything, especially knowing that a lot of these factors I mentioned just before are inter interrelated and intervene at several levels. But from my point of view as a professional, I would say the true question is, what should we prioritize? Okay, because all of the above have some level of influence and establishing what these priorities are and are, and are important. And then but to establish the priorities, we need to first understand the, the, the problems that are behind all of this. So some of the problems that St. Lucia faces in public health are similar to other contexts, such as uh, too few specialized clinicians, um, for example, pathologists or oncologists who are deeply involved in the treatment of cancer patients. This is a common to other low-income contexts. So we could very well in this situation, like we, we love to see in St. Lucia, why we reinvent the wheel. So we could go into a database and pull out some information and look at in, the data on best practices or uh, solutions on this topic. 
On the other hand, there are other factors and um, problems which are unique or specific to our small island context. Uh, I can cite, for example, occupational banana farming and special dietary regimes like eating chicken backs could possibly be um, things that are very unique to our context, or if not completely unique um, in the places where these things are present, may not necessarily be the priority area, right? So in this particular case, I would say, let's do a research study, right? To understand, to understand these problems. Um, I've get, in my personal experience, I've had some bit of resistance. People said in, um, said saying, uh, after the study, will there be any impact? Will there be any change? Or will there be another report on the shelf? So this is something that's said to me very frequently. And uh, this is a, a testimony of a long-standing problem that we have in St. Lucia, uh, which is dissemination of uh, scientific findings. So not only we have a major public health problems um, in chronic disease management and prevention, but we also struggle to use the various tool that we need to make change in our population. And some of the reasons for this insufficient dissemination is the fact that we know there's a lot of know-how embedding in our people. So we have evidence of strong human resource. We have been able to produce a lot of academics and Nobel laureates, but then having all that know-how embedded in people is not sustainable and there's insufficient documented knowledge to be able to drive the innovation of small island systems. Other the lower level factors I can cite is brain drain um, and uh, also inadequate organizational structures in our uh, primary tertiary institutions and also the fact that we tend to underutilize the social, civil society. So with this dual dilemma of public health problems and uh, lack of dissemination, um, how do we now drive this innovation in our small island populations? So Valeri, from my understanding, was designed to solve this problem. I cannot speak for the whole of the organization, but I know I personally, uh, Valeri has, has been able to position me as a resource person to develop uh, robust research in the community through mentoring, networking, and just meeting with a lot of common professionals on the ground. So this was very integral for me to be able to find myself, position myself to do the work I'm doing today. And in addition to that, I was able to, um, I, was, I was given tools and resources to be able to perform that indigenous research. So as I put into my research with Valerie, uh, one of the overarching research questions that I um, I'm, I like I, I'm asked to fund in my work is how do we build health systems for our small island context to effectively control chronic diseases? So you notice I didn't this time I didn't mention cancer, I didn't cite cancer that, um, specifically. This is because um, there's a growing consensus that if you want to prevent cancer in low and middle income countries, then there needs to be an integrative approach where we look at. Uh, other chronic diseases like diabetes and hypertension simultaneously. So it's important to be able to have this broad overview of chronic diseases and not just cancer. So in my research, this, will fo this focuses on the actual island geography and isolation and also the under-resourced settings that we live in, which are major characteristics of countries like St. Lucia. So like I mentioned before, the challenges are in St. Lucia are unique and they call for a unique approach um, not just using epidemiology, but the research that I propose on, with Valeri is very, is that it lies at the intersection between epidemiology, health systems research, community health, and imp implementation science. So one of the first examples I'd give of some successful research that was done would be, is based on uh, needs expressed by the community. So I work very closely with Face of Cancer St. Lucia and I'm very attentive of what they need as patients and survivors in their, in their group. And uh, one of the, the major burning, the burning, burning questions that they had is, is how to f improve follow-up after abnormal screening at a typical Face of Cancer health fairs. So if you, so this is a group that's very active that does health fairs all the time, but there are stumbling blocks in their, their value chain, in their, in their process where um, there are evident problems, right? And if you know a thing about uh, cancer prevention or chronic disease prevention in, 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 on, a, on a whole, you know that if you have 
cancer screening that is a positive result and there's no linkage to treatment, then you're not saving lives the way you should be. So this is a, one of the problems that, we, that were brought up in that group. So one of the first steps that I took to tackling this problem, so this was about almost two to three years ago, uh, there was, I put together, uh, I started conducting a scoping review with the help of my student, Chelsea Branford, who was able to um, scan through the literature to look at the treatment linkages, treatment linkages strategies that are, have been reported thus far in literature. So what we found was that there are very few uh, high quality studies that looked at that kind of community health and treatment linkage, and even fewer con um, studies of that nature in developing countries. So what this meant for us is that we needed to we need to create our own indigenous solutions and our own uh, research. So as of uh, a few years now, we've been building or uh, working towards leveraging the data from the community health fairs to be able to to bring to light that research. So this research work is, this research work is, is currently ongoing at the stage where the data has been collected. Um, in the meanwhile, I am currently engaged with a similar organization, Project Pink Blue, which is a patient association advocacy group which operates out, out of Abuja, Nigeria, where we're doing similar research in uh, cancer prevention. So yes, the context is different. We're no longer in a small island context, but uh, Abuja and Senusha do share some similarities. We both operate in very low income settings and we want to find out how do we actually do that cancer prevention when you're on a budget, when your, your government and um, different authorities may not have the luxury, luxury of providing resources for all these different um, cancer prevention tools. So yes, it may be different, but it's very much complementary. Um, so, so those of, I'm not going to detail all the findings from this research, but for those who are interested, the, the, there's a paper that um, I co-authored with Project Pink Blue and other colleagues that have been published in the Lancet Oncology, which is one of the leading cancer journals. Another interesting area that um, I've been trying to tackle with my with Valerie and um, colleagues from the college is social disparities in health in St. Lucia. So it's a big topic and uh, uh, there's a lot of base and fo foundation work that needed to be done. So one of the first things I wanted to find out is how to, to accurately measure socioeconomic disparities in St. Lucia, especially based on income. So I don't know if, um, for those who don't know, uh, income is a very difficult variable to collect. Um, in my experience, uh, most persons tend to either omit their information on income because they're trying to avoid um, taxation and not just trying to declare their income, or they, may tend, they tend to maybe underestimate their, their monthly earnings. So in this typical context, we're seeing something similar. And uh, the work that was done using secondary data from the ministry to analyze uh, the different uh, determinants of monthly income. So we were able to, to find significant association between certain household amenities, such even including hot water at home and monthly income. So let me ask why use hot water at home? Um, and just before I go on, I just want to, I'm realizing I'm not passing the slides at the same time. So sorry. So when we ask, um, what am I saying? Oh, here we are. All right. So just to highlight really quickly, I want to thank Dimitri Grono because Dimitri is a master student that worked with me last year. He was very instrumental in putting together this um, this, pri this project on socioeconomic disparities. And um, so if you're not completely convinced by my um, my reasoning on why hot water is important, so there are. Um, there has been work that I've been done where I use hot water as a socioeconomic indicator, and there are significant associations that have been found. So we know that uh, based on a small sample of cancer patients, we know that having hot water at home was indeed associated with more travel overseas for cancer treatment. So based on the information that I found for uh, the, the link between income and hot water, we know that what we found is indeed, um, there are indeed socioeconomic disparities among cancer patients. So these results have been presented at a conference, um, I think two months ago, and there's a special issue coming out of cancer epidemiology biomarkers and prevention in June. So look out for that if you're interested for more information, or you could contact me for the, the conference abstract. All right, so uh, looking at more on the, the social disparities in health, looking this time specifically at help seeking behavior, we want to understand why patients present too late for cancer? Because a lot, lot to do has, a lot of it has to do with possibly 
the inherent behaviors of patients, or it could be um, provider or organizational factors. All right. So again, you drawing data from uh, secondary data from the ministry, we are able to confirm or, or see. Um, sorry, not confirm. We're able to show that the choice to seek help at first versus not doing any, not seeking any help or self-medicating was not significantly associated with socioeconomic status, which would suggest that these are maybe they're not, they're not inherent factors to the patients themselves that cause them to present leads. So this, um, there may be more organizational factors. So this work I just showed here, there are no statistics, but just to give the general idea, there, the, these were done on the general population, and I saw something a similar um, trend among cancer patients as well. Right. So another critical area that um, needed to be addressed was uh, cancer survivorship. This is a, a very important area. And uh, of course, clinicians work on the ground, policymakers, public health administrators, they know, uh, they have a big idea of what's happening, of course. Um, but nothing has been really documented um, before 2021. So the final found it was important at the time to document these unique experiences because we are island people, we do live in the Caribbean, and there's not, not much known. So there was a, a great interest among multiple stakeholders um, from the patient support group, from public health administrators, from uh, the OECS and uh, Valerie, which banded together to create a unique group um, to create what is known as the DCAP study. So the, this collaboration of these various organizations may seem um, simple, but this is very much novel, uh, not only for our context, but this the combination of patient support groups and administrators and academic is very, we struggle to do that even in a developing country context. We often miss, we're missing the, 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 the link with the community and with administration and policymakers. And in this small island context, I was able, successfully able to bring band everyone together and create a, the first study on survivorship. So simply put, this um, study was to give a broad overview and as a pilot of uh, 50 cancer survivors from St. Lucia. Uh, there's a community-based study, meaning that there's active involvement of sort of, uh, support groups and uh, the in intermission was collected in a semi-quantitative manner. So there were some closed questions and also open-ended questions on the survey. So there was a lot of information that came from the study, but to uh, give, go to the essential um, findings, one out of two patients uh, travel for cancer treatment. So that's one of the things that we found. Uh, in addition to that, delays for cancer treatment initiation was greater when traveling for treatments. So there's a difference by maybe 10 or so days. And social support systems seem to be weakened during cancer care versus. So based on these observations on this pilot study, a new question came out. We wanted to find out does traveling for cancer, neg cancer can negatively impact cancer outcomes? So to do this, of course, um, me being myself and having the um, drive to the research, I decided to create a new research study um, called CASIDIC, um, which stands for the impact of overseas travel on cancer care in a small island developing states of the Eastern Caribbean. So that's a big mouthful, but to, to be called it short, I just called it CASIDIC. So it's supposed to be uh, DCAP 2.0. Right, so the main objective of CASTEDEC is to investigate the effects of overseas travel for care and patient centered outcomes in all six uh, independent um, island states in the OECS. So Antigua, Dominica, Grenada, St. Kitts, St. Lucia, and St. Vincent. So a very ambitious task. Uh, we like to establish a cohort of 650 adult cancer survivors over three years uh, of any cancer type or histology with, uh, with, uh, who have accessed care in, in Lucia, or oh, sorry, care in the island of residence, seeing that there are multiple islands involved. So one of the first aims that we're looking at is uh, asking, is overseas travel associated with longer treatment and delays for, to start treatment? So this could be very well because of uh, visa requirements that have long application processes and timelines, or it could be maybe the family needed to plan an additional fundraising event to uh, cover accommodation costs, which is something that um, gets extremely expensive when we have to travel some destinations. So to do this, um, we would like to compare um, time intervals to treatments 
between persons treated overseas and persons treated on island. Second objective is to try to understand are patients treated overseas more likely to have healthy habits and quality lives after their initial active treatment. So once they're done, their cancer is in remission, they've done all they need to do to, to, feel, to, to, to get treated. Are they living lives that will enable them to live longer and to avoid cardiovascular events and to avoid a second, uh, um, the cancer from coming back? So to do this again, we're going to employ a similar approach. We're going to uh, measure lifestyle factors post-treatment. So we're going to use a lifestyle score, which is a combination of many different um, things like uh, BMI, um, diet, physical exercise, and maybe integrate um, certain things like alcohol drinking. So we're going to take these lifestyle scores and compare the scores between those persons who are treated overseas and again, those persons treated on island. So the goal of this um, at the end, so the long-term objective as well. So our future perspective is to use these data use this data to create the baseline for and a foundation for a follow-up study, which is supposed to be more robust and it will be the first research resource on cancer outcomes among survivors in the Eastern Caribbean. So in terms of data collection, uh, the plan is to use the same methodology and the same questionnaire that we used for the, the ECAP pilot study. Um, but with the small addition of an updated section on help-seeking behavior to further understand the nuances in this part of the cancer care continuum. And also, we'd like to add a brand new questionnaire on lifestyle um, post-treatment, which will be able, will enable, enable us to answer the questions for objective two. In addition to the self-reported surveys that we'll be having, we tend, to, we tend to pull out information from patient health records Again, so this is, um, this is why the engaging the ministry at this point is very important to be able to further um, that study because um, from my experience, we, it's something that will very much complement the self-report and it's really critical to have proper measures. So the final objective of this study has to do with social support. We want to understand does traveling overseas um, pro deprive you of your social support system? Is the fact that you have to travel to Miami for care uh, mean that you have to leave your family members behind? If you have to, this, I've seen people who are maybe who are going to India in, in the, the private survey who may have more than likely not necessarily have family members over there. So the idea of this is to do an in-depth qualitative uh, investigation on patients who finished the initial active treatment or still ongoing treatment, as well as their caregivers, because we want to have a holistic understanding of what, what that, that process looks like for them. Um, so we're planning to do one-on-one -on -one interviews and as well focus groups. Um, again, um, tr comparing treat the, the process and live experiences of persons treated overseas and those treated on island. So the potential impact of this is, is really, is, is projected impact is, is, is very much, um, that we will understand finally the gaps in overseas care, overseas care, which since it's a very integral part of our small island health system. And once we understand those gaps, we can now identify priority areas that are needed to be addressed. So maybe it could be um, with visa requirements, visa, visa processes that are too long, that need to be shortened. It could be um, targeting patient navigation or improving the social support system of our people in the goal to then reduce ultimately cancer deaths in St. Lucia and to work towards more resilience in the country. So currently um, we have obtained ethics approval from the ethics committee in St. Lucia and Grenada. So that's good news for us. Uh, we have uh, obtained uh, op the support and endorsement of all the major cancer support groups from the six islands. And right now we're looking to engage other stakeholders such as the Ministry of Health to be able to uh, build our investigation team and, and begin the study. Um, so a bit of good news, um, the study, uh, we have not been able to secure any um, funding at the moment, um, but this project has been nominated for the Atip Avenue Award, which is one of the most um, prestigious awards for early career investigators in public research in France. So pen, this, this 
depending on this how this goes, it could this could mean a lot of things for that study. And uh, in ideally, really, really ideally, I'd like to start recruiting patients around October 2023. So it coincides with um, Breast Cancer Awareness Month. And this recruitment process will go on for three years. And uh, we have to add on an additional year or two for uh, data analysis, uh, reporting, and dissemination of that information. So reach the end, but before I um, end, I'd like to just acknowledge first and foremost our study participants because without them, there would be no DCAP study, there would be no study whatsoever. So I thank you very much for raising your voice and um, being, being making, making this presentation possible. And now we've learned so many things because of you. I'd also like to acknowledge and um, our interview officers on the field, Ms. Margaret Jill Charles and. Uh, Gifter, who is a community leader, who is very much instrumental in gathering their data on the field. Um, and there are other people on there, but I cannot list everybody in just a time. Maybe I can go back and thank them. Um, and a special acknowledgement to my AC3 mentors, the African Caribbean Cancer Consortium, for just giving me a lot of guidance in um, putting this, these studies together in the past few years, especially Dr. Camille Reagan, who's a PI of the consortium, and Dr. Joanne Oliver, for helping me put together the CASIDIC proposal and for um, the NIH K43 submission last year. And for anyone I've forgotten, thanks to all my other collaborators, the Pré de Loin, and um, thank you for your attention as well. Thank you so much. Dr. Ogis, we want to open the floor to questions, but um, I first want to congratulate Dr. Ogis on his award for his research. Give him a round of applause for that, please. And I know that one of the reasons that Dr. Ogis is here is because he wants greater collaboration with St. Lucian organizations, St. Lucian businesses to further his research. So that's my little plug-in for him. And now I will open the floor to questions from our audience, both online and in person. We're monitoring you on YouTube as well. So any questions or comments um, from you, the audience? I have two hands going up. So we, we will defer to our guest, Miss. So this is our our lab supervisor. We will know. We will defer to our epidemiologist, Dr. Fasoa, first, and then we will move to. Thank you. Um, you highlighted several public health um, challenges that we face in St. Lucia. Um, you mentioned that it is specific to St. Lucia, but from my experience, um, they are very common in most of the small island developing states. Um, it is challenging, these are challenges that we face due to our lack of resources, due to our limited capacity to deal with the loss, but it's very common of most of the small island developing states. Um, my question to you, you brought up um, quite a few studies that we've done. Um, for example, the report about the economics of the use of the charging of vaccines for cancer treatment. Um, was there a qualitative aspect to that in terms of finding out what was the reason why you were so late in socioeconomic status with the charging of vaccines, or what, what is happening in that space? All right. Thanks so much for that question. And I acknowledge what you said a while ago with the commonalities with other countries in the Caribbean. And let me just go to the slide. So we're sp speaking of this one, right? So there was preliminary work that was done. So this is, this is a well-known thing. Huh? This has been done in uh, a study that I did in Guadalupe and Martinique, where we use hot water as well. And we did see significant associations coming out. Um, it's just that formally, it hasn't been demonstrated as yet. Uh, looking at the data, anecdotally, we can look, we can see that there is a link. Um, but in Saint Lucia, it hasn't been done in Saint Lucia yet. So there was preliminary work that I did for a student who came here physically at the college last year, who looked at uh, from the, from again secondary data from the Ministry of I think it's Finance or Economics, which looked at the link between um, household amenities and 
uh, monthly income. So it was not just hot water. There was the fact that you have maybe a, a dryer at home or you have exercise equipment. Do you have access to a, a laptop? So there were um, when the, one of the things that came out, which was very, very significant, was having hot water at home. And this was already a measure I was accustomed to using uh, many years before. And I decided to use it for St. Lucia because I was like, why not? And uh, so I validated this last year. So it, there is some um, a lot of evidence now that shows that there is a link between hot water and um, income. So this finding here with the travel is uh, evidence of a big socioeconomic gap between cancer patients and access to care. So um, usually in small samples, we do not see associations very clearly, but then the gap is so big that uh, with the sample, even with, despite our small sample size, we're seeing significant results. So this should mean something and it's a critical gap that needs to be filled. Um, you mentioned one of our things that we're talking about today. Um, I think our discussion is about the work, but um, definitely cancer research is something that the ministry are really interested in. So um, I look out that already to see what um, information we can generate from that and to look out in terms of um, planning our cancer um, program, fully developing our cancer program. Um, my question to you again is what, and that, that will go for institutes of cancer, what level of collaboration okay, can we expect um, from the, the one with institute for research and innovation? And I'm going to do just the cancer asking, is it in developing protocols? Are we working together in terms of HR? What level of collaboration are we expecting or can we anticipate as an initial process? So from in my capacity as a researcher in Pavilary, um, I intervene or well, I've been mostly in the research. Um, I've been solicited by um, our chairperson to um, evaluate some policies that would came by him. Um, and I know as well, Valerie has uh, worked substantially in helping the policy development. Um, maybe um, our assistant um, vice principal <laughs> could help us um, answer these questions. But in, in, in my capacity in terms of research, definitely um, there's a, this, with the research I've done so far is I would say very novel because the fact that we actually collaborate with the community Academics plus policymakers, even in our context in France, is not necessarily very, um, doesn't happen very seamlessly or fluidly. So, this is a, already a groundbreaking for us. So, I would very much say it's a clean slate, and we're very much open to shape that however we see fit and what, how, we'll see what works best for both of us. So, um, Mr. Harris, I would hope that we could put you on the spot. Um, since it's an opportunity for you to speak a bit to, to Valerie for clarification, because a couple other people, based on the flyer, had asked me about Valerie. And what we do is that we do research and project uh, and um, provide a resource to other institutes to get into the same thing to get to the area. For example, um, in the case of Libya, the media is really good. What we did was that we got other areas to get that information and we got to get it into the between the research that we wanted to do and other entities to ensure that we got the outcome. So in the case of any form of research that, that goes on on an island, we seek out funding so that we get that research. Once we have the research, uh, get through it, the research we get to some of the challenges that goes at a urban island, for example. Um, sometimes we get a lot of roadblocks, so we tend to intervene to us and bring some of those obstacles to the way of the researchers to ensure that they're able to get it. So definitely we we are looking to collaborate more so with more entities to ensure that this goes on. Since I have no way, could I ask one question? Go ahead. During your research, did you find any correlation between social status and cancer prevalence? 
No, because the data that we collected does would not be able to speak to that. It would not be it wasn't just designed for that purpose to look at um, the incidence of cancer. Um, to do that, we would need a more powerful tool that I dare not speak of here because it's very controversial. But it was not designed specifically for that purpose. But just to answer, um, it is known that in um, that in most populations that there are there is a significant socioeconomic divide. Um, but then it hasn't been confirmed in St. Lucia or not. The socioeconomic divide there, it hasn't been, there hasn't been any form, study formally to look at it, but I know in surrounding islands, like in Martinique and Guadeloupe, it's very much um, obvious and evident that they, they exist. Go ahead. So my question is uh, that we, um, when we spoke about looking at outcomes as children of women survivor outcomes, so cardiovascular um, events or chronic, other chronic um, diseases or comorbidities that sometimes, um, I guess, they maybe go pre existing or um, develop after cancer treatment. Um, and I think that's kind of where your, um, your focus is, um, just in what we do in the state of Ireland to move forward. And so have you seen and in your research, I mean, you haven't seen any data that would suggest or think, I mean, it'd be very unclear in the future, but um, that people who survive, you know, if we're talking about five years of cancer treatment, um, is there a link between um, the type of survive and yet these um, conditions are falling out as well? As well as cardiovascular disease, is there a link that you see or any, anything that would suggest? Um, and then again, I'm thinking about what ages are we talking about? What, you know, typically when we think about you know, cardiovascular disease, we kind of, um, the data is kind of showing that that happens maybe later on in life. So maybe we are talking about Okay, so that's a very interesting question. I do have a interest. I do have my own take on it because, well, when I'm not um, doing research in Saint Lucia, I actually work at Gustave Roussy in my lab. So this is the very um, thing I was uh, recruited to do, study comorbidities and uh, cancer outcomes in the French E3 and cohorts. So, and I do have some um, um, knowledge on that. So it is, uh, like one thing I can say for sure is that comorbidities and cancer is an established um, line of research worldwide, but because it, it is known that even after we do survive our treatment, we were in remission, there are a lot of um, adverse outcomes, health outcomes that cancer survivors face, whether it be through their treatment or the surgery. So they, they may suffer a lot from lymphedema. You may have certain um, chemotherapy treatments, may, which may um, in, increase the risk of cardiovascular disease or heart um, infarctus, in myocardial infarction, or even um, from what I understanding, there's diabetes is a big thing as well because of the way chemo is administered. Um, so from a population standpoint, yes, it's a very, um, it's a critical field to be looked at. And um, there is research that has been looked at, um, not specifically in the Caribbean context, unfortunately, but it's a well-established line of research. And uh, as for age groups, I think certain outcomes may affect older persons. Um, so of course, hypertension and diabetes, but I think there are certain things that happen across the cancer care continuum, continuum and things that happen in survivor's lifetime, which would predispose them for certain issues, for example, lymphedema, which doesn't necessarily have a, um, I think once you go for that, there is a, you stand up a high chance of, of, of suffering from loss of mobility or loss of quality of life. So those are um, important things, so yeah. And, um, there is a question online, Dr. Elise, can I read to you? We have some issues with the other mic. In your opinion, what are the broad actionable steps that the health authorities and policymakers in St. Lucia 
can take to truly see improvement in the overall quality of public health care. What can be done? Um, okay, so first and foremost is planning properly, meaning because um, we're in a low resource setting, we don't have a lot of resources, so we need to know what can we target to get the best bang for our buck. We don't want to just spew out resources, and that may not. The question is not very easy. Um, I think. Looking at the, the way things are implemented is very important. Um, and one thing that works for sure in our context is community prevention. Um, I think that's something that uh, we need to really go towards people and speak to them, let them understand what cancer is, the symptoms, chronic diseases, these are the consequences. So um, honing really on that personal social contact because from the data I'm seeing, um, and I just, even for me, I was surprised to see that when I read for the interviews for the cancer survivors in the DCAP study, a lot of them just wanted to have a strong social support system. They didn't mention much about um, their chemo. They didn't mention much about um, you know, their, the, the treatment they were getting. They were more concerned about, oh, I, the fact that I had uh, I was surrounded by people and loved ones and friends and my employer accompanied me, that was very crucial for them in their journey. So, yeah, I think that could probably be a, be a good place to start and maybe um, from, I don't know what it would mean in terms of resources and investment, but that's something that can be done almost, I think, immediately. Um, just assisting the social programs and assisting the, the cancer support groups to provide us support. The other two, Dr. Ogis, are um, comments. Um, and I guess they were responding to something that you had said earlier, saying it has been a long-standing issue with St. Lucia to the point where almost every single family has at least one horror story dealing with the public health sector. And they went on further to say with no real observable improvements over the past few years, and where persons will actively stay away from healthcare due to the complete lack of trust in the system. Um, and I wonder if you could comment, especially on the, the lack of trust in your research. I know you earlier, you had some of the popular comments that are made by um, individuals. Um, so just in your research, what are you getting in terms of St. Lucian's response to, to the health care that is provided in terms of trusting what is said? So it's, there's no really, really easy um, answer to that question because I think it's a bit more nuanced than that. Uh, what I can say is that um, among cancer survivors, there were um, some persons who did ad um, admit openly that there was some level of distrust in their um with their providers and they were even some who said that they were convinced that their providers just wanted to make money off of them um and there there is evidence of distrust because we have a lot of persons who do travel for care as i was showing in the study so it's at least all close to half of the sample which travel versus um for reasons that go way beyond just access to services locally so they may be going for a simple surgery that could be done here but whatever, I can get that done in Martinique because I have my, my aunt or uncle who lives over there, I'll get it done. And we see a lot of that happening now and now, and more and more, sorry. And um, there, it's, it's, I think there's a limit to what, the, 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 what, we should, what can be done overseas. And like the Catholic study strives to show is that possibly there could be adverse outcomes associated with traveling overseas for care. Did anything come up in your research um, with alternative care as well? Not just traveling, but looking for alternatives to the medical medical care. So alternatives to conventional medicine. So at the end of the DCAP study, I was a bit disappointed. I didn't find many, um, much evidence of that, um, unfortunately. I did, however, um, collect a lot of information on what patients do themselves as for self-medication. So we do see the traditional sour soap and papaya leaves and whatnot. So there is evidence of patients seeking self, um, using self-medication, um, but no formal self-seeking from the alternative uh, allied professional services, very few. Well, he was doing cancer, so I was asking him what did his research shows. 
Because so for example, right now in the United States, they have a against um, chocolate milk and sweet. Right. So you're aware of that. Because they're saying the sugar content um, for young students is too high. And of course, that's very controversial because they're still saying that milk is important in terms of diet. And to get young children to drink milk, they are implement uh, the chocolate milk has been introduced. But there's always been a link between sugar and cancer. So I think my question is the following. We're always looking at putting a bandage on the boo-boo. So after you get the cancer, how do we deal with it? Um, but what about in terms of educating, I'm always starting off of the primary schools. What are the, what's happening with ministry? Perhaps you can, under, you can answer that question as well. What are they doing to speak to the children about eating well, diet related, exercise, et cetera, et cetera. I know after form three, correct me, Natalie, PE is not required in the secondary schools. So therefore we're already teaching our young people that exercise is not part and parcel of, it's not part of a, a, a normal lifestyle. It's more important to do IT, chemistry, biology than to exercise and to learn about a healthy lifestyle. So once again, the question is, what are we doing in primary schools to educate our children about having a healthy lifestyle so that cancer then does not become part of their existence? That's a wonderful question. So I will answer it first. If um, our representative of the ministry wants to speak on that, can leave. But let me just say first that we have a big problem in terms of primary prevention in St. Lucia. I'm not putting the blame on the ministry or anyone, but in general, um, I mean, I mean, very frank, in St. Lucia, from the data I've seen, the average person, the, the median average monthly income is uh, 2,000 EC dollars. So it's a huge problem. So yes, uh, we can educate, we can spread awareness, but we need to do it properly, we need to plan us um, properly. Um, second thing is that if you really want to fight um, social inequalities in, in, in most in, as majority of the population, I don't think St. Lucia is an exception, you need to do it on a high level and not put, place so much of a burden for cancer prevention on individuals. So yes, we have the knowledge, the knowledge has been imparted on us, we know we need to avoid sweets, we know we need to avoid um, salt drinks, etc. But in higher up, there are different barriers on, on different levels, the interpersonal level, the organizational level, that will challenge what we can do as an individual. So yes, I know soft drink isn't good, but then we have a bottle of soft drink, an icy bottle that may cost less than a bottle of water. So there are these factors that come into play, the social, also socioeconomic aspects. So what will happen, I can tell you from a public health point of view, if you start channeling these messages haphazardly, then it's possible that down the line, yes, you will reduce the cancer burden, but only among those persons who have the ability to do so, which are the persons who are higher socioeconomic class, and there's going to be a wider and wider socioeconomic divide in council outcomes. So yes, it will work, but then we have to keep in mind that there are um, barriers on the line that we will face if we continue doing that anyhow. So I think there, um, to avoid that, to counteract that, there should be some form of uh, uh, built-in environment that we can at least change or transform the environment around persons, maybe not, maybe implement things in schools who, it's not necessarily legislation, but you know, rules and regulations that could enable um, students or force them somewhat or push them in the right direction to choose the water over salt drink or choose, I don't know, carrot sticks over hamburgers, etc. They need to be higher level interventions and not just place so much burden on our children because if we were to tell a 15 year old, exercise, eat right, cabbage, carrots, you know, five, five fruits and vegetables per day. The issue is that if they go to the family, they tell their mom or dad, dad, I want carrots, sticks and cabbage to go to school instead of fried chicken. Then the dad says, well, I'm a, I'm a, I don't call any professions, but they may say, well, it's not possible. I'm so sorry. You have to stick to fried chicken and soft drink. So these are practical things that I see in public health that are not necessarily that easy. So I don't know, I'd like to answer your question or if the ministry wants to. So <clears throat> thank you for that question. It is a very important question. Um, primary prevention is key. Um, we have recognized that at the ministry and all of our programs, when we look at either campaigns or we look at implementing something, we always look at the kids first because the kids, and I will use outside of um, NCDs, for example, um, when we decide to run for vector awareness, we, we target the kids because they're the ones who go home and say, mommy, this is collecting water and mommy, you should not have this. And they are our little advocates in the homes. And parents tend to listen to the children because they tend not, 
they, they are very cognizant that the children recognize that the nurse came in or the Ministry of Health came in and they said something and you're doing something wrong, mommy. So they pay attention. So it, it follows similarly in our other programs. Um, recently, it was this week that our dental unit went into the schools targeting them, yes, with their teeth, because the teeth and our chief dental, our senior dental surgeon will not let us forget that the teeth are very important. People tend to omit and tend to forget about it, but it is a significant source of infection and um, NCD issues. So we target the children at that level. Um, our nutrition officers are at the schools as well, together with our Bureau of Health Education, educating the children from very young as to what needs to be eaten, what are the good foods, what are the bad foods. We have lobbied very um, long and hard to get uh, sugar sweetened beverages eliminated in the schools. Um, it continues to be a challenge. Some of them are still being sold. Some parents are still sending their children to school with it, and the teachers are doing their best. But um, I do take your point. It is quite significant, and it is an area that we continue to focus on, and we're hoping that by educating them from young, they will develop those behaviors that we're hoping to see our adults adopt so that we will not have these issues in the future. Because when it comes to obesity and um, diabetes, hypertension, a lot of us are guilty. And um, I take what Dr. Ogis has said in terms of um, diet and the socioeconomic status. At this point in time, it is very difficult for a family to put a well-balanced meal on the table and not include a big pan of rice and, and, and fried food because it is, the reality is it is cheaper than macaroni and cheese, etc. It is cheaper than buying the vegetables, than buying a lot of the products out there. So we have to try to balance these, identify the issues, the socioeconomic issues, and find ways of working with them. We try to encourage them to grow their backyard garden so that the cost would be less on them. But um, the struggle is real, as they say, and we continue to work with them on the ground to develop these healthy behaviors. Thank you very much for that. I always think the big bad wolf is always capitalism and economics. Because even if ministry is doing their part, I find that these young people are bombarded with you know, the, the people selling the chubby. So for example, at Jazz on the weekend, you couldn't find a salad bar. You know, all of the food was fast food, fast food, fast food. So I think our, the, I mean, the entire society is always at the canteens at the school. You go to any secondary school in the canteen and you must get the fried bakes. You must get the fried chicken. So even if you're teaching this information, if the students don't have access, then they're not good. They, they can't make better choices. Nobody sells carrot sticks, you know? So therefore, I mean, you can give them as much information as possible, but if they do not have access to it in the school environment, so for example, do all the schools have water fountains to encourage the young students to come in with water bottles and fill up their water bottles and choose water as a first form, as opposed to looking for the chubby? And why are we even letting vendors come into the school? Because the vendors have to make money. Right. So therefore the big bad wolf is still there saying, tempting our, 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 our children to buy the chubby, buy the Shirley biscuits, buy, buy, buy. And then these big organizations, instead of reducing, and I'm talking about the companies who should be more responsible, reducing the sugar content in these drinks, are keeping it at the same. So, I mean, the, the situation, we really have to deal with these corporations who are pushing, and these people who are pushing the food, the bad food on our people. And as grown-ups, or things like jazz, things like carnival, making sure that there is an, an alternative option. I had to walk with my own food because I knew that all I would be able to get would be fried food, fast food, you know, at these events. Are we making these proper choices available to the masses? And that's my only comment. Thank you. Very nice comment. Thanks so much. Um, but it, I agree, it's it is very difficult, but um, definitely if there's interest, I can always give my point of view on a, on a different forum to see how we can work towards that. There's a follow-up question. Hi, um, this is another, uh, maybe another spin on things. Um, just a comment or, um, and this has to do with, I guess maybe the, I don't want to say prevalence, but um, there's a higher incidence of colorectal cancers, bowel cancer um, in younger individuals um, recently. Um, so, and even, even breast cancer, um, I think when I was very young, um, I don't want to quote what the, um, medical literature said, um, just to make sure I'm accurate, but 
your screenings actually happen later on in life. And um, there has been such a high incidence of breast cancer in young women. Um, and I think more recently, I've been hearing a lot about colon cancer, bowel cancer in, in the United Kingdom in particular. Um, do you have any comment or um, suggestions about how, you know, in a small island state, um, we can kind of get ahead of that? Um, do we have to, like with screenings, do they have to start um, occurring earlier? Um, you know, do we have to change the age at which people start screening? Um, or is it, some, you know, I mean, a colonoscopy, for instance, is optional. Um, I know in the United States and more developed countries, um, that's something that, you know, is probably um, everybody, most people have access to or more people have access to. So, you know, because when we talk about, you know, physicians saying that, you know, you're getting a cancer, um, by the time you see a physician, you're at an advanced stage. And so how do we get in front of that? You know, how do we, you know, if you have a stage one colon cancer, your, um, your likelihood of surviving um, is, is significantly increased. Um, and so your treatment options are, are bigger um, and your, your life outcomes are bigger. So I'm just trying to think, how can we start thinking about those things, you know, um, as we see them happen in more developed countries? And I think even here it's happening. Um, you know, you don't always hear um, about these stories, um, but what can we do to kind of get ahead of things and really um, kind of help improve our own health outcomes? Okay, that's a very interesting question. And I am aware of the literature on early onset colon cancer and uh, what's been seen in, in the U Europe, specifically the UK. So there has been a steady increase. Um, now the thing is uh, colon cancer screening, whether it be through fit testing or colonoscopy, is kind of tricky. Um, I can't remember exactly why, but I know it's not as black or white as we may think it is. The solution could be let's screen everyone in between X age and Y age. But um, there is a substantial risk that may be involved, especially if we're looking at colonoscopies, where people may um, it's a very could be a very invasive exam. So um, it's not that simple. But I think everything starts with good planning, um, looking at maybe the risk factor data. Um, I'm not a specialist of colon cancer, but if there, if we know, if there are the literature, if we know a good, we have a good knowledge base of the risk factors of early onset colon cancer. If we look at that in our population, then that could give us a big idea of uh, are we really concerned or not by um, early onset cancer and seeing the urgency of uh, um, you know cancer in low and income countries like Saint Lucia, then it should it would be worth um, considering adjusting the policy to match our 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 unique setting. So to me. Um, yeah, it's not that simple. There's a little nuance, but I think definitely it's, it's worth looking at at least the risk factors for those cancers to see if we're really um, expecting to see an increase. But one thing is for sure, the liter international literature says that in developing countries, uh, colon cancer incidence will increase. That's one thing for sure. Um, there is a, you know, as we develop, we become more westernized, that we are expecting to see increase in ca colon cancer incidence. Um, not too sure in what age groups, but then if it, there is, if it does rise, there should be mechanically, I guess, a rise in, in early onset cases. Um, let me just comment on that. Um, a lot of the cancers, especially in women, cervical cancer, breast cancer, in the men, prostate cancer, a lot of these things, as you indicated, if they are found at a very early stage, the chances of survival are significantly increased. Um, and that is why I asked the question on research and collaboration, because it's not just a matter of just screening, just telling people. But we have, for example, in our wellness centers, the women can come in and get a, a pap smear, get a, a breast exam. Um, men can come in and get rectal. I mean, I know men don't like it. Or get a PSA done. <clears throat> However, you find that persons come in only after they have found a lump, only when there is significant dimpling in the breast only you know when when something is wrong that is when they go in to get screened and at that point most times it is too late so i think the the, the question here is why are persons delaying that much if the services are available why the delay 
And um, I don't think it's just a matter of trust. It, 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 may, it may very well be. It may very well be that, listen, when I go in and the wait, if it takes a month to get the results or two months to get the results, I can't wait that long. But in all honesty, I have spoken to persons and a lot of times, dog, I, I don't think I want to know. But at that point, you, you will find out because there will be changes in the body. You will find out eventually. And at that point, what can be done? So I think the understanding, thank you, health seeking behavior, understanding why it is people don't go in to get screened, knowing fully well that if I go in early enough, something can be done to save my life. Yeah, I agree. It's a mystery to me. Um... Uh, there's the data to confirm certain things because there is a data set from the Ministry of Finance or uh, Economics, I can't remember which one, but there is, I do have a data set on that topic that I'm currently exploit, um, analyzing, so um, hopefully there may be more information on that as uh, months go by. Um, is there an intention to have uh, further studies done like on NCDs as well? So yeah, so I, if I'm not mistaken, you're representing the Diabetes Foundation in St. Lucia. Yeah. So we welcome, we welcome you, we welcome you, we welcome you, we need you. And uh, like I said, um, I've been to uh, meetings internationally and uh, the recommendation that's coming out for cancer prevention is that we need to leverage off of existing NCD prevention framework in the country and also leverage on um, just the other chronic diseases altogether to find common solutions for, for, each, for each one. So we definitely um, want to explore different areas and just pull out the understanding from the diabetes prevention and probably um, put that into other areas that we have where, where we're lacking a lot of um, data and information. I, um, are there a deliberate mechanism to get that information out to the public? The, um, the, your research? So that's a good um, comment. So, and I like that comment because um, my uh, coming here was very timely um, through, because dissemination, of course, um, I struggle with it because quite frankly, when you're done doing the research, you tend to be very, you know, you're tired at the end. We publish a paper, we're, we're exhausted. So the community work, going and spreading the word to other persons, the lay people, the general public, it's very strenuous, um, but something that I'm, I'm hoping to work on right now um, through Mrs. Fannis' help, I was put in contact with a young man who has expressed a great desire to help me disseminate all of these findings uh, in the solution public. So uh, he's probably not here this morning, but um, he knows who he is, um, a, a former graduate of South Lewis. So there is intention to do a better job of disseminating because it is a, we do struggle with it in St. Lucia and I struggle with it as well. Thank you. Dr. Ogist, thank you so very much for being here with us this morning to share uh, your most valuable information. We want to thank our in-studio audience, we'll call it our little studio, and those who joined us live as well. Thank you so much for being here. I know your work will continue. You know South Lewis has an open door for you, and um, I hope the linkage that you've made with Dr. Faswa will reap some very fruitful benefits. So ladies and gentlemen, we've come to the end of our second in our lecture series. Please stay tuned to our website, social media pages, where we will continue with facilitating such um, engagements. And Dr. Faswa, our door is also open to your ministry for us to do more work. And we will put you in touch with Valeria as well. So thank you so much. Enjoy the rest of the day. And uh, please direct other professionals that you know would be interested in this to our YouTube page so that they could follow um, this lecture. Good afternoon. Thank you.